All right, we didn't get enough money. We're going to go around again. No, I'm just kidding. What a great day to live for the Lord. Man, tonight we're going to pray. I'm excited about that. And um, we're going to see what God can do. I don't want what I can do. I want what God can do. Isn't that what you guys want? We got some Teen Challenge guys visiting us today. Thank you guys so much for coming. I left working at Teen Challenge in 1978. So, um, yeah, they weren't even born. You weren't either. Have respect for your elders. Good heavens, these kids nowadays, I tell you. Well, anyway, we're going to talk about prayer because that's what we're doing this week, right? Prayer. And I, guys, I, I we'll talk some more later, but uh, Teen Challenge for me was a huge growth experience. And I was on staff, and uh, it, was, it was just a time God called me to fly during Teen Challenge. Uh, I met my wife at Teen Challenge. She wasn't in the program. She worked there. I, I have to clarify that or she gets mad at me. She worked longer than I did. She worked with Inner City New Orleans Teen Challenge before, back when it was before they closed it anyway. But anyway, we're going to look at stuff today. Let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. What a great day to live for you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will work in your word today, that you will help us to understand, Lord. Help us to get something out of your word. And I thank you, Lord, for every person that's here, Lord. Every person that is here today is ordained that they be here. I pray that you help each person to grow in their relationship with you. I pray pray that you place in us a hunger to know you so that prayer isn't such a chore, but prayer is is something we look forward to, to spend time with you. And I thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1, we started last week talking about Nehemiah. Nehemiah is, is a phenomenal character in the Bible. He's going to be in my, my book series, the top 100 characters in the Bible. I'll be writing about him in there. But um, Nehemiah was one of those Jews that was captive in a foreign land. The Babylonians had conquered much of the known world at the time, including Jerusalem, and then they were conquered by the Persians in 539 B.C. Who cares, right? And the Persian Empire stretched all the way from Western Egypt all the way to India. It was really the first um, world empire at the t- uh, ever. And um, Jeremiah, while well, he he was the prophet that was prophesying all the time that Jerusalem was being destroyed and carried away captive for that for that period of time, the 30, 40 years there, he was prophesying to those people. And, and the ones that got carried off to Babylon, he sent them a letter saying. Stay, stay put, kind of settle in the land, pray for the people of the land, because you're going to be there a while. And other prophets were, were falsely prophesying, hey, you're going to be back in two years, everything's going to be just like it was before. He's saying, uh-uh, you're going to be there for a while, so you better settle in and pray for the prosperity of your country, because you're going to be living there for a while. And that's also, this is Jeremiah 29, that's also where he says you're going to be there for 70 years. And that's exactly what happened. So somewhere in there, Nehemiah was born. And I got a, a picture of uh, Susa, which is where Nehemiah was. Uh, you, it's really hard. I don't know how well you can see that. Yeah, you can see it better. The, where it says Elam, uh, you can see it. It almost looks like it spells Susa there. That it, it does. That was a, was a southern capital of the Persian Empire. The, I mean, the, the, the um, wintertime capital of the Persian Empire, and it's located in modern-day Iran. And this city is one of the oldest in the world. It goes back to 4,000 B.C. I got a couple of pictures of ruins here. I really wish I could go see some of this stuff, but I don't know that I want to go to Iran right now. But anyway, there, there's one, one, uh, one there. You can go to the next one as well. They're doing some digs there, I guess. Uh, but anyway, this was the place, Susa, the capital Susa, the winter capital, was a place that Esther married Xerxes. And this was before Nehemiah. Now, we talked before, if you come on Wednesday nights, we're dealing with some of this stuff as well. But um, the Jews, they left in three groups to go to Babylon, and they kind of came back in three groups. 
there was the first group that came back with uh, Zerubbabel, and that was um, that was around 535 B.C., and then that was about 50,000 of them came back. And about 75 years later, a little over 75 years later, a group comes back with Ezra. It doesn't give us the number, but it was in the thousands. Came back with Ezra, and then finally, not too long after that, Nehemiah would come there. And so, as we look at Nehemiah, we, we if we review from last week. You remember he was he was there, and he, he says his brother shows up from Jerusalem, and he says, "Oh man, Jerusalem's the they, they burn the walls down. Everything's not going very well," and it bothered Nehemiah. Now, you think about this. Nehemiah was living in the, in the town of Susa. Susa at the time was a modern city, as modern as they got back then. I mean, they don't have the stuff we have today, but for them, they didn't know any better. That it was modern for them. They didn't have refrigerators and things like that, but it was modern for them. And he was there. He was settled. He, uh, and he, he was probably ready to spend the rest of his life there. And then his brother shows up and says, hey, man, things aren't going well in Jerusalem. And it bothered him. And th this brings us to a point that sometimes you may hear something and it bothers you. That should make you want to pray. Because if it bothers you, the Holy Spirit is speaking to you that he wants you to begin to pray about this situation. So that bothered Nehemiah, and he began to fast and pray about it. And as you remember, he, he, it records his prayer in the, in the first chapter of Nehemiah, and then he closes it out with this, this weird statement that shows up, and he says, I was cupbearer to the king. And you're thinking, what, what does that mean? I was cupbearer to the king. This is, like, this is like a disclaimer. You know, you listen to the commercial on TV, and he says, oh, yeah, you can do this, this, and this, this, this. And at the end of it goes, blah, 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 in, law, in legalese, so fast that you can't understand what they're saying, or the print's so small that you can't understand it, and you don't realize it says, oh, yeah, the lease is only $300 a month, but they don't tell you in the small print that you've got to put down $6,000, and you can only put 5,000 miles a year on the car. Anyway. Well, Nehemiah says I was cupbearer to the king. It, it was kind of like a disclaimer to everything he just said. Because here he's cupbearer to the king, which means he may not even be able to do anything because a cupbearer was an important position. He was the one that made sure that the food that came to the king, the drinks that came to the, the king were okay. You know, he tests them first, and if he dies, when they probably, the king's probably not going to drink it, right? So, so he had an important job. You couldn't just trust anybody because one guy might come in there and go, I didn't really sip it, you know, and give it to him, and he's really poisoned, you know. Anyway, this is it. So um, here we go to chapter 2. Nehemiah understood the unique position. In spite of the disclaimer, he understood that just like Esther, he would have known about Esther 20 years or so before. He would have known about the position she was in as queen it, to be able to speak to Xerxes. And so now here he was, Nehemiah, dealing with Xerxes' son, Artaxerxes. So let's start out in chapter 2, verse 1. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was brought for him, I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had not been sad in his presence before, so the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad And when, are you, what, uh, when you are not ill? This can be nothing but sadness of heart. I was very much afraid. But I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should I, my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors were buried lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Now, it had been about four months since his brother came. I didn't realize it was, that, it was that long until I was reading some commentaries and noticed the two different months it lists. But it had been about four months. And we don't know if he had any times that he came before the king during that period of time. But we know that he'd been praying about this situation. And finally, here we were four months later, he was still bothered by the situation back in Jerusalem. And he has this opportunity to be before the king. But he was sad. And, you know, you're not supposed to be sad before the king because, well, I mean, he's the king. How can you be sad? I mean, I tell this to my wife all the time. How can you be sad when you're around me? I mean, don't you know who I am? How wonderful I am to be around? 
And how could you be sad around the king? He's so wonderful. He's, he, he's this wonderful person. You know, I was thinking about this, you know, when we, when we come and we, we worship God. How can we be sad when we're in the presence of Almighty God? You see, worship is really W-R-T-H, ship, worth ship. And who's worth more than our Heavenly Father? So we're worth shipping him because he's the king of kings and the Lord of Lord. And so anyway, he wasn't supposed to be, Nehemiah wasn't supposed to be sad in the king's presence because the king was kind of like a god. Well, anyway, he says, why shouldn't I be sad? My hometown is destroyed. And so it's, it's kind of interesting. It says that he prayed a prayer there. It's like he prayed a quick prayer. Have you ever prayed quick prayers? You know, it said for four months he'd been praying. You know, he'd been fasting and praying and seeking God. Oh, God, what do you want me to do? And I, I think about it. When, when uh, Nehemiah was, began praying, he wasn't praying, Oh, God, give me the opportunity to go back to Jerusalem. He'd never been to Jerusalem. Why would he want to go to Jerusalem? He was content to stay in Susa. But as he began to pray, God began to change him. And at some point in the line, along the line, when he's praying, God began to lay on him the burden of him going himself. It's kind of like us praying for a missionary. A mission, it's kind of like Teen Challenge. You're, you're, you're saying, oh, God, help the Teen Challenge guys. Oh, God, help the Teen Challenge. You know, Lord lays a burden on your heart. This is what we did to me, guys. I, 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 so one of my friends, uh, I, I, was, um, I just left a gospel group, and I was recovering from an automobile accident, and and. Someone said to me, oh, why don't you come over to Teen Challenge? We're having a New Year's Eve service. I said, nah, I don't bear witness with my spirit. You know, that's the normal answer you say when you don't want to do something. And, and, uh, but then I got fired from my job. It's always been good when I got fired. I got to tell you that. But anyway, so I got fired from my job. I didn't have anything else to do. So I thought, okay, I'll go over there. And I went to the New Year's Eve service. Daniels was already there working there. And, and, and the Lord laid the burden on my heart to work at Teen Challenge. Now, guys, I'd never even been drunk. Didn't use drugs. Knew that was stupid. My dad was an alcoholic. Why would you want to do that to yourself? My dad was a genius. He was a World War II fighter pilot. He was an athlete, and he screwed his life up because of alcohol. Why would I want to do that to myself? I knew it was dumb, but the Lord laid that burden upon my heart, and that's what happened to Nehemiah. He began to pray, oh, God, what about the walls? What are you going to do, oh, God? How are you going to fix this problem? And God says, you go. Wow. That's what we need in this church right here. We need God to begin to speak to people and say, you go, you go. And, you, you know, we, we make our excuses and we say, well, I've never even been drunk. How would I can help anybody that's on drugs? You go. Because when God calls you, he empowers you. When God calls you, he makes you able to do it. And so over these four months, Nehemiah is praying and he's fasting. He's saying, God, what about this? And God's beginning to lay the, the burden on his heart. So the king says to him, what is it you want? He prayed that little prayer right before it. Like I used to do when I'd go in for check rides in the airlines or other things. You know, when you got to go in there and get in the simulator. And, you know, you say, Lord, help me. You know, all the, you've been studying for months. But you go in there and God helps you. And so the king says, what do you want? Now, Artaxerxes... He's, he's king of an empire that goes all the way from western Egypt all the way to India. Don't you think this guy had something on the ball? He knew what a good answer was. He knew what he's expecting from this guy. And so Nehemiah couldn't just say, well, oh gosh, <laughs> can you send me to, to Jerusalem to fix the wall? No, nah, he couldn't do that. He had, to, he had to know what he was talking about. And so Nehemiah has done this research. He's done this research. And, and, and so, look, I, I was thinking about prayer. And um, this, this passage of Scripture is, is meant so much to me. It says, um, if you can give me the next slide there from James chapter 1, verse 2, it says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. 
Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because anyone who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to That person should not expect to receive. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all their ways. But we're going to get into this just a little bit. This passage of Scripture is is just jam-packed full of stuff. It says, first, when you have stuff happen in your life, you're supposed to count it all joy. What? We're supposed to be happy because bad stuff happening? That's not what it says. It's supposed, it says you're supposed to count it all joy when stuff happens because what is taking place, if you let it, is going to bring about character change in your life. It's going to change. You know, it's hard to change. Uh, we were visiting, uh, we were at a wedding yesterday, and I saw some people that at the church we went to up in Columbia uh, for for two almost two years, and some of the people we hadn't seen in six months, and and there was a group of them that had lost like fifty pounds a piece. It's like, oh yeah, that's that person, you know, because they really. I mean, it takes radical stuff to make you lose weight like that, to to make change like that, and so when stuff happens in your life, we're supposed to count it joy, not because oh yeah, I'm happy that my tire blew in my car and I ran off the side of the road and hit a tree and it totaled my car. That really makes me happy. No, that's that's not what you're supposed to do. (laughs) You're happy because God is helping you through this and somehow he's going to help you have character change in your life. Now, anyway, didn't James say something that's kind of strange? He says, if any of you lack wisdom, what? We're talking about trials. Why did you bring this up? Because he wants you to have wisdom to deal with the trial that you're going through. That's why it's a perfect place for it. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Who, I learned in the King James, I'm sorry. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men liberally and upbraids and honor will be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that is like, he that wavers is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Let, the, let not a man think he will receive anything of the Lord. But now, then I thought. This is a great example. So this is what's in the box today. A drone. Hopefully, no one's going to get hurt today. And hopefully, I'm not going to ruin my drone I've already, ca- I've already crashed it numerous times. That's a good sign. All right. We're going to talk about prayer. This is you. Dennis, that's you. I got it right. Not, I want to call him Dom because he's Italian looking. He looks like a Dom to me. So, Dennis Dom, this is you. All right. This is you going through life, Right? Oops, I don't want to do that. So this is you going through life, and you're just kind of, all right? When you pray, though, it's like you're taking controls of your life. Oh, goody. Who knows what's going to happen? So when you pray... I wish I could drop a bomb on them, you know. That would really make it more fun if I could drop something on somebody. But if you could, when you, when you say a prayer, before you pray, you're like, this is wandering through life. Wherever the wind happens to go, wherever it happens to go, that's where you're going. It's just going right there. It's just the way it is. Let's go up a little bit. But when you pray, you're giving input to your life. You're making it do what you want it to do. And that's the thing we need to know about prayer is it's, it has a positive impact on our life. You're changing things in the spiritual realm when you pray. It makes a difference in your life. All right, my wife's telling me to stop. I don't know how to land it. I got to tell you, this is, 
Only way I know to land it is by crashing it. No, no, don't go over there. No. Oh, oh, it, see, now it's backwards. <laughs> okay, kill it. Oh, good. All right. So, that was my Christmas present. She got me a helicopter a few years ago, and, well, it didn't last very long. It was a lot harder to fly than this because as soon as you hit it and it went, it was like the other side. It would be in a tree like 30 feet up. And Anyway, but um, praying, praying is, is giving input to your life because you're just hovering. But when you pray and believe, you're, gav- you're giving input to your life. You're making a difference in your life. And so that's what Nehemiah was doing. He, he was praying. And so Artaxerxes wanted to know. So um, let me go through these scriptures real quick. The next one up there. So this is uh, when he says a prayer. He says, then I prayed to the God of heaven and I asked the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let, me, let him send me to the city in Judah where my ancestors were buried so I can rebuild it. Now, Nehemiah attacks this thing in two points. Remember, he's going before the king. The king could, because he's been sad in the king's presence, he could say, you can't be sad in my presence. He could have him killed, but he, he has a relationship with Nehemiah. And so he, he says, well, what's going on? And he says, well, I want you to send me to, back to Jerusalem to rebuild it. He doesn't say, I want you to send me to Jerusalem and give me all these supplies and stuff. He breaks it down into two parts. He says, I want you to send me, because all that other stuff doesn't matter. If he doesn't doesn't send them, if he says, well, you can't go, I really can't spare you. You know, I mean, you've been helping me here for years, and you know what goes on around here, and you're in charge of things, and and so I really can't send you. And so he could have said that, and so he breaks it down into two parts. The first part is he asks for help. He asks for him to send him, and look what it has, what it says. It says, then the king with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take, and when will you get back? And it pleased the king to send me, so I set the time. Now, it doesn't tell us what the time was. We know from, from reading later on in Nehemiah that he would spend uh, well over a decade there. Um, but, I, but I was thinking about, you know, when, when God asks us to do things, we, we come up with all kinds of excuses. You can, re, you can read about it in Moses' life. You can read about it in Abraham's. You can read about uh, in, in Gideon's. These are some of my favorite characters. And we always make excuses. Uh, well, I don't really know how to do it, you know. And, and I, my mind kind of goes. I was thinking about um, Nehemiah. He hadn't, he hadn't taken Building 101 in college. He didn't take any management classes on how to motivate employees. He hadn't taken graduate courses on conflict resolution and dealing with resistance in government. He didn't have any. And I thought of some other things. This is relevant to you guys. He didn't know what kind of help he was going to get when he got there. Um, He didn't have Colonel John Giles to lead the troops. He didn't have Sergeant Everett to, to whip him into shape. He didn't have uh, a major police force, Major Randy and, and Officer Stanley there to say, you lawbreakers, do this or do that. He didn't know what he was getting into. He didn't know what anything was. There's no record of Nehemiah ever having built anything. He hadn't even built a, a gingerbread house. And here he's going to a, a place, and he's going to rebuild a wall. And I, and I just think, what a great object lesson for us to be willing to step out in faith and do something that we totally have to depend on God for. That's what God wants to do with this church. You you don't have a clue what God's going to do with us right here because he's going to ask this church to do something that you're you're not prepared for. You don't want to do it. You don't feel qualified for it. But that's when you have to depend on God. Um, Ron and Ron and I are starting on buffing the floors next week. You know, these floors, how wonderful they look right now. Uh, hopefully they'll look better after we get done. It's not a guarantee. 
Uh, Jason used to do that. And was Josh here today anywhere? No. Um, but it, th this is a big step. I mean, when you don't know what you're doing, it's hard to do anything. And so we're going to be we're going to be uh, tackling that. We'll see how far we get with that. But anyway, let's look what he says here. Um, he says, "I also said to him, if it pleases the king, may I have letters to the governors of the trans?" Uh, I'm not going to read all that. Basically, he asked him to give me letters for safety and give me the building supplies. Two things: give me letters so that they'll know I'm okay. I'm coming through here, and then he gives me, and then give me the building supplies. Now. If we go down there a little farther to the next part, I, this, I, I see things in movies. So look at these. In verse 10, it says, When Sanballat the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite official heard about this, they were much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. So, so here's the way I envision this. Nehemiah's the new sheriff. He's just coming to town. So you see him riding on his horse. He's got his gun strapped on his side. And he drives in the old western town. And you see up against the wall over here next to the saloon, these couple of guys have their cigarettes. And they're got, one of them has got a cigar in his mouth. And they're looking at Nehemiah when he comes into town. Now, you just know from that, the music just changed. You know how when the music changed in a movie, you just know that these guys, these two guys, are going to be trouble. So the music changes when Nehemiah goes by there. You know there's going to be trouble. And that's what's happening. So that's just a foreshadow for next week. Let's talk about what this means for you today. Okay, I, I summed it up into four things today for you guys. And then we're going we're gonna to pray. I want you to notice our little board over here. This board is very spiritual. Um, on it, it has dollar signs for money, family, healing, job, guidance, and miscellaneous. So to, this is the week of prayer. So you're praying about something. Praying about a family member. Put a little tag up on there. Now, you don't want to say, I mean, you, you don't want to say, uh, I'm praying for my wife, Dana, because she's such an idiot, you know. You don't want to put that up there because everybody's going to read it. So be a little discreet in what you put up there, you know. Okay, you know, put, put something up there. Lord, help me in my finances. Or Lord, help me. And you don't have to put your name up there, but we're going to do that after a while. So anyway, along those lines, I, I, I always look in the Scripture at principles we can draw from it. And here's a couple of principles we can, talk, uh, we can draw. Attack the problem with prayer and fasting. When you pray, when you fast, you're adding controls to those. You're, you're putting input in those controls of your life. You're not just sitting there hovering, not going anywhere, or just wherever the wind happens to take you. You're giving direction to your life. We know that Nehemiah fasted and prayed for four months before he had this conversation with the king. So we need to understand that everything doesn't happen quickly all the time. But we, but we need to pray about it and give to God the, the time and the chance that he needs to make things happen. Number two, allow God to change you during the waiting time. A lot of the, a lot of the problem is us. You know, God's got to prepare us spiritually. He's got to prepare us. Um, one, of the, one of the words in that passage from James was perseverance. Well, that word is actually hupomone in the Greek language, and it, it means more than just, I'm hanging on till the end. It's more than that. It's, it's being able to go through trials and struggles with your head held high and your shoulders back, knowing that God has everything under control. That's what it is. And so we need to allow God to be in charge of your life, to change you, to help you during the waiting time, as you're waiting to go to Fairbanks. God is working in you. He's bringing about character change. And then get your ducks in a row. Arrange your ducks. I had to have an A at the front of every one, you know. So arrange your ducks. You know, Nehemiah, for those four months, as he was praying, as he was interceding to God, God would begin to show him things that he needed to do to build a wall. I mean, he, he, he got out 
he ordered the book uh, Building Walls for Dummies and, and studied that and went through and read the chapters on it so he knew what he was getting into. He looked at YouTube videos about how you're supposed to do it and the kind of plaster you'd have. He went to Home Depot and he, and he took a, a class on um, building door frames, you know, so he'd know how to do the, the wall, the, the frames for the gates. I mean, that's what he had to do. He had to prepare himself. And when, you're, when you, God puts you in something, you've got to prepare yourself. When God called me to fly while well, I was a teen challenge, I spent thousands of hours studying for flying for different airplanes and stuff. And, and that's what we have to do. We can't, well, just like Artaxerxes expected Nehemiah to give him a good answer about what he needed, God expects us to be proficient in what he's called us to do. And that takes us jumping into it with everything we got and allowing God to give us a passion for what we're doing. And then finally accept the challenge and take the first step. I remember when uh, Dane and I started a, a kids' choir years ago. Uh, as soon as we, were, we set it up to start the kids' choir, I bet I had four different people come up to me and say, oh, yeah, I always wanted to do a kids' choir. Yeah, oh, yeah, I've been thinking about doing a kids' choir. You know, I had them, a number of people come up to me. Well, why didn't you do it then? I did it. Dane and I jumped in, we, not because we knew what we were doing, just because it needed to be done. And that's the way it is with God, is he calls you to do stuff that you don't feel. You're not always the most talented person. There might be two or three people in this congregation who could do that job better than you, but you're the one he called because these three yahoos won't get off their butt and do it. You know? And so we need to accept the challenge and take the first step. It's really easy to talk about all the stuff you would do or could do, or might do, or someday you'll do. But it's another thing to actually take the step and do something. You know, it's just like when that drone was there. You know, oh, you just kind of float. Oh, God, help me, you know. But you don't, there's, no, there's no faith in that. Lord, your word says that you're going to help me, that, you, that I can come boldly before you. I mean, you're going, you're, you're putting that thing where you want it. You know, when I, when I, when I was flying airplanes and you're coming into land, you have to look if you, like you're in a jet. You're, you're, you're looking, you know how it is, John. You're looking 30, 40, 50 miles out ahead and figure out what you've got to do to get down. And it, you may have to do something aggressive. You've got to get down. You're in an emergency. You have to do something. You don't want to be sitting up there going, oh, what am I going to do now? How, how many of you would like to be in the back seat of an airplane like that where um, you're wondering what he's going to do? So you've got to, have to you gotta accept the challenge and take the first step. step. You've got to learn to... to Learn to do what you're supposed to do. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to pray. Um, what I want us to do is I want us to, to take a few minutes. If you, We've got our board up here. We've got these, these pads up here. We don't have enough pins, so bring your own pins. We've got three markers. And I, and I want us to, to pray and to, and to begin to put things that you want us to pray for, for you this week for you. Yeah, oh, here's a bunch of pins up here. Yeah, bring them, put them up here. Let's stand. And we still got to do communion, so don't anybody leave. Block the doors back there. Mark, don't let anybody out. You're the biggest guy back there. Don't let anybody out. All right, um, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, you see our lives. You see us how we wander sometimes. We make mistakes, and you forgive us, Lord. You want to forgive us. You want us to move forward with our lives. You want to help us with our lives. You want to give us direction to our lives. You want to answer our prayers, oh God. And we pray right now in Jesus' name that you will help us, Lord. Help us to find your direction, Lord. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to give you an opportunity while Bruce comes and plays. Uh, if you could, you could put things on the board up there that you want to see God answer prayers for. And that doesn't mean you can't add to it later on. Tonight, we're going to be here all this week. So you can add things to it. You can put other things on it that you want to while we're sitting here. Hallelujah.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, God, help us to believe that you can touch our lives, that you can answer prayers, Lord, that you can change the trajectory of our lives, that you can help us make good decisions that affect our families, affect our lives in so many ways. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, you can put up more than one.
We're going to take communion now. Um, uh, gentlemen, if you can come forward. During this time of taking communion, we're supposed to examine ourselves. Hey, I got to look at this guy. You got to look at you. You think you got problems, you should look at me. But no, don't look at you, me. Look at you. Because God's got to help me with me. You know, God wants to do some amazing things with us. And if we'll, if we'll let him, he wants to do some amazing things with us. Hallelujah. Now, Jesus started this tradition of communion at his last supper. Every, all the disciples there, including Judas. And it wasn't that God wouldn't forgive Judas. Because Peter denied Jesus as well. It was because he didn't, didn't ask for forgiveness. He didn't change. And whatever you've done today... Whatever is in your life, this is especially for Teen Challenge guys. I know I, I had like 200 guys in my program over the years. Whatever you've done with your life that's wrong, that you feel bad about, I want you to know Jesus forgives you. Hallelujah. And he wants to take you from where you're at today and do amazing things with you. He tells us at the last supper, he says, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we just ask you, Father, not to take for granted what you've done for us. That you will help us to remember the, the pain that you went through, the love that you demonstrated by putting up with us, by, by going through that. You didn't have to do it. And we ask you, Father, to help us to, to want to be obedient to you and do the things that you want us to do. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may partake. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. You may partake. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Can we sing that song you were playing, Give, give Thanks?
Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hey, it's been a great day. If you see somebody you don't know, say hi to them. Say hi to the Teen Challenge guys over here. You guys have a great day. We're coming back tonight for prayer at 6 o'clock. See you. Thank you so much.